Well, it is indeed a pleasure to be here tonight, and it is certainly a pleasure to see all of you who have taken the time to come out tonight and be a part of this gospel meeting. I am always uh, grateful and thankful for an opportunity to be able to preach, and I'm thankful to this congregation, uh, the leadership here, for uh, allowing me this opportunity, and I hope something can be uh, said today that will help you on your spiritual journey. So the topic today, uh, tonight, is refocus the Christian life struggling with sins. And a verse I would like to read to you tonight that kind of sums up maybe the idea of tonight's topic. And Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 17. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, sold into sin's power, for I do not understand what I am doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law, that it is good. So now I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my flesh. For the desire to do what is good is with me, but there is no ability to do it. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but I practice the evil that I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but it is the sin that lives in me. So I discover this principle. When I want to do what is good, evil is with me. And uh, some people have said that this particular passage of scripture in some ways is called the perpetual internal civil war that goes on between the flesh and the spirit. And it is something that we all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis as Christians. Now, I want to pause there, and I want to come back to that later on in the message. But uh, this tonight, we want to look at these things. First, so you have an idea of where we're going. Uh, first, we're going to look at the outline of sin. That's the terminology. Then we're going to look at the origin of sin. And that's the temptation. The operation of Satan. And we'll look at some of his tactics. And the obligation of the saints. Those are our tasks. And finally, we will look at the opportunity by our Savior. And that's the turning point that we have uh, for us in our lives. Now, when you think about the human race, and this is universal all over the world, there have been many technological advances that has shaped the direction of humanity and in many ways uh, help us to do things in a better way. Uh, think about the invention of the radio or the invention of the automobile, the invention of the airplane, the telephone the computer, and even the internet. These things are what we consider to be normal, but at one point in time, they did not exist. And when they were invented, it helped humanity go in a different direction, and it shaped the world as we know it. But not only has there been uh, technological advances, but also there have been many medical advances. You know, now people are able to do heart surgery. Uh, people are able to do brain surgery, knee surgery, knee replacements. And even now, we can do organ transplants. Take the organ out of one person and put it into another person. And most of all of these advances that have helped to propel humanity in a different direction 
Most of all of these advances were invented and discovered because there was a problem that human beings were trying to solve. And with all the advancements, whether they're technological, whether they are medical, they also are problems. There are a lot of problems that exist in this world. Think about wars and these problems that man cannot solve. Poverty. What about global warming? What about heart disease? Finding a cure for cancer. What about finding a cure for declining health during old age? All of these things are major problems that we deal with as human beings in the world. And these problems are great. And these problems are major. And they affect people all over the world. But there's one problem that's bigger than any of these problems. And I submit to you today that that problem is sin. That's a problem that man cannot solve on his own. This is a problem that affects every person in the world. No matter whether you're young or old, no matter where you, whether you are rich or poor, no matter your ethnicity, your race, your creed, no matter your station in life, Every person that lives on this earth has to deal with the problem of sin. Now, God made a provision to try to address that problem. In the Old Testament, we read about uh, God instituting a law where he commands the people to offer animal sacrifices, uh, to acknowledge their sin, and to absolve them of any consequences or any of the guilt of the sin. But the Bible also tells us that that provision was not sufficient. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 6, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And therefore, God had to send his only son down to the earth to be that sacrifice, to be that offering so that we can solve the problem of sin. Now, when we think about sin, and this universality. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then John says in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So as we think about the Christian life and struggling with sins, and I'm thinking about the idea, the key word there is struggling. The Christian life struggling with sin. Now, the word struggle means to have a uh, strenuous effort to be made against or in the face of opposition. That is, there's some tension between two different things. And I think that tension exists is what Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 7. But this struggle between good and evil, this struggle between wanting to fulfill the desires of the flesh and wanting to live the righteous and holy life that God has commanded us to do. This is a tension and a struggle that we all have to face. And it is not just something uh, for the novice Christian, but it's also something for the mature Christian. This is a problem for us. And that's why we need uh, Jesus Christ. So as we look at this this morning, first, I think if we're going to address the idea of how we deal with sin in our lives, how do we deal with this struggle? Then we must first understand what sin is. And that's the terminology. So what is sin? Well, the Bible says that sin is a transgression of God's law. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 3 and verses 4. He says, whosoever committed sin transgresseth the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Now, when we say a transgression of the law, the law, we're talking about the Bible. We're talking about God's word, God's commands. In particular, for us today as New Testament Christians, we're talking about the things that God has commanded us to do that we can find written in the New Testament. So John says that sin is a transgression of the law. Anytime we go beyond what is written and given to us in the book, then God calls that a sin. Now, I know we live in a modern time where people now try to redefine things. 
and people call things that once were sins that they consider them to be sins no longer. But the word of God has not changed. And what was sin when God said it was sin is still sin for us today. Now, there are two different ways that you can sin against God. One is that you can go beyond that which is written. You know, Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 32. He says, whatsoever thing I command you, I want you to observe it and I want you to do it. Do not add unto it, neither shalt thou diminish aught from it. Uh, Paul writes to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, he says, he says that the brethren should not go beyond that which is written. So the first way we can sin is that we go beyond what God has commanded us to do. Now, that's one way to sin. Another way we commit sin in our lives is when we fail to do what we know to do is right. See, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 7, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I understand what God wants me to do. I know what God wants me to do, but I fail to do that particular thing. Now, that's what sin is. Now, there are lists in the Bible of sin. If you want to find a list of particular things in Galatians chapter 5 and 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Romans chapter 1. But uh, uh, even 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I believe. But we're not talking about the specific sins. I just want to lay the foundation to understand what sin is. So anytime we go beyond what's in the book, it is a sin. That is to transgress the law. Uh, some people describe sin as uh, missing the mark. Uh, here in 1 John, it is a transgression of the law. Think of it this way. If, if I were to draw a line in the sand and I say, don't cross that line. If you cross that line, then what have you done? transgressed. You've transgressed the boundary that God has set. And anytime we transgress the boundary that God has set for us, then it is considered to be a sin. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's a toe over the line. It doesn't matter if you put a foot over the line. You can put your whole body over the line. Either way, whether it's a toe or whether it's your whole body, when you cross the line, then God says that is a sin. So we first need to understand what sin is. But not only do we need to understand what sin is, let's look at the origin of sin. Where does sin come from? Now, the Bible says in the beginning. Now, this is before the beginning began. God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible doesn't give us a lot of detail, but many believe that God also created angels and the angelic host. And when God created the angel, he created one angel who the Bible describes as an angel who was more glorious than any of all any of the other angels that were created. And the Bible says that this angel was lifted up with pride. And because he was lifted up with pride, we're talking about Satan. He was cast down to the earth and all the angels that followed him were cast down and reserved in chains of darkness. Now, Satan knows where he's going. There is no redemption for Satan. There is no salvation for Satan. And what Satan wants to do, he wants to take as many people with him as he can. This is how evil and diabolical Satan is. He is the originator of sin. Peter describes him as our adversary. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, Be sober and be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. This is the description, a lion. He is a lion. That is, he is relentless and he is ruthless in his attack. And he is our adversary. So that is, don't, make no mistake about it, Satan doesn't like you. He doesn't like me. He doesn't like the church. He doesn't like anybody that wants to do anything righteous and good and follow the will of God. Like, don't, don't be fooled by Satan. Satan hates you. 
Satan hates your family. Satan hates your children. Satan hates the church. This is why he is called the adversary. Jesus says this about him in John 8 and verse 44. Jesus says that he was a murderer from the beginning. And he abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is our adversary. And he wants to draw us away from God through temptation. If we go back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3, we read that the serpent uh, Satan through the serpent approached Eve and he said and, and God told Adam and Eve that they could eat of any tree that was in the garden except they could not eat of the tree that was in the midst of the garden. And so Satan came to Eve and he said and he said unto the woman yea hath God said that thou shalt not eat of the tree of the garden trying to tempt Eve to convince her to go beyond what God has already commanded. Now, that's the origin of sin. It starts with Satan. But not only does it start with Satan, the origin of sin, it originates with the self. That's us. See, Satan cannot cause us to sin without our participation. Sin originates in us through temptation. James says in James chapter 1, in verses 13 through 15, he says, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, because for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man, when he is tempted, he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin, it is finished, it bringeth forth death. So what James is telling us is that sin is a process. We don't just wake up one day and commit a sin. Before we sin, it must first start with a lust that we have within ourselves. So Satan says, I mean, uh, uh, James says that Satan uses our own lust to draw us away into, into temptation and sin. The Bible says, but every man, when he is tempted, he's drawn away from his own lust. And then it says, when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. So there is a, a space between the lust and the sin. So when I have a lust that comes to me, there is an action that I have to take to carry out in order for that sin to be brought about. Now, the Bible also says that when sin, it is finished, it bringeth forth death. That is the end of the sin. At the end of it all, when we live a life of continual and perpetual sin, the ultimate end result is going to be death. And that is spiritual death. Now, Satan is going to tempt us. This is a part of the struggle. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was talking to Peter and the rest of the disciples were with him, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And when he says this to Peter, he's not talking just to Peter, but the word you there means all of you. That is, Satan has a desire to have all of us that he may do what? That he may sift us as wheat. Now, what does that mean? What does sifting us as wheat mean? Well, that's an, that's an old agricultural term where you separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, uh, today we have machines uh, that do that for us. But, you know, back in the old day, uh, before the machines were, were made, in order for the farmer to separate the wheat from the chaff, the farmer had to take the wheat and put it on a, 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 a hard surface, probably a, most of the time it was a stone surface. So the farmer would take the wheat and place it on the stone surface and then the farmer would take a stone 
and smash it and smash it against the wheat and then take the wheat and throw it in the air and then the wind would blow away the chaff and then the wheat would fall back down to the threshing floor. Then he would take the wheat again and he would smash it and he would repeat the process, smashing over and over again, trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, Jesus says that Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. That is, Satan wants to separate you from your faith. He wants to violently smash you and make things difficult for you in your life so that you no longer trust and believe in God. You think about the story of Job. Didn't he try to do that to Job? He took everything away from him. Why? so that he could curse God and die. And, and if Satan can't get you one way, he's going to try to get you another way. He even got to the closest person to Job, trying to get him to leave God. But this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to separate all of us violently, just as you separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, Satan tempts us, as we said, and he tempts us through our own lust. When a man is tempted, he's drawn away from his own lust and enticed. Now, there are only three ways that Satan can tempt us. In 1 John chapter 1 and 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16, John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the only three ways that Satan can tempt us. And Satan uses our circumstances that we are dealing with in our lives. And he uses that to try to tempt us. Think about Jesus. When Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible said that he hadn't eaten anything for 40 days and 40 nights. And when Satan came to him, he tempted him with the lust of the flesh. What did he say to him? Can you turn these stones into bread? You see, he takes that situation he's in and he uses that as a temptation to get, uh, trying to get Jesus to sin. Then he takes him on a high mountain and he says, you see all of these kingdoms. All of these kingdoms can be yours, the lust of the eyes. And then he takes him to another mountain and he says, well, if you be the son of God, why don't you throw yourself down and God will save you and lift you up. That is the pride of life. And so the point is, that's a prime example to show us how Satan uses our situations. And he uses those things within that situation to tempt us to sin. So that is the outline of sin. That is the origin of sin. But now let's look at the operation of Satan you know, his tactics. We're going to deal with this struggle. We need to know something about Satan. We know who he is, but we need to know something about how he works. Now, Satan has tactics. That is, there are some characteristics about him that we need to be aware. Uh, one, Satan is deceptive. What he is, he's deceptive. When Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11, he says, therefore, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, the word wiles there is talking about the deception of the devil, the idea of a person lying in wait, waiting on a prey to approach, and then once the prey gets close enough, then he pounces on the prey, and he takes advantage of the prey. He is deceptive. Satan will make you think one thing, but all the while, there is another. Don't be fooled by Satan. He will show you a good thing, but on the other side that you can't see, that's the bad thing. So when you turn on the television and you see these commercials and you see a person uh, and they have these, these alcohol, these liquor commercials, and they show the person, they just look so cool and calm, and they seem like they have it all together, and they say, you know, take this drink and you'll be cool. Take this drink and everything will be okay and you'll have a great time. You see, they show you that part of it, but they don't show you the people 
who have lost everything because of alcohol addiction. They don't show you the person who is now homeless on the street because they cannot stop drinking alcohol. They have lost everything because they took that first drink. You see, when Satan shows you something, he only shows you what you think is the good side. But he is a deceiver. When you see the commercials about the casino, you know, come on down to the casino and have a good time. Try your luck and you can be a winner. And they show the person having a great time and laughing and smiling and they're pulling the slot machine and bells are going off and everything seems great. But they don't show you. They don't show you the person that has lost their house. They have lost their family. They have lost everything because they can't stop gambling. Satan is a deceiver. And we don't need to be fooled in thinking that just because it looks good now, that is going to be all right in the end. The Bible says when sin, it is finished. It brings forth death. You know, Solomon said, I believe, in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number six, he says, the bread of deceit is sweet unto a man. But afterward, his mouth is filled with gravel. It may seem good now. But Satan is a deceiver. This is one of his tactics. Not only is Satan a deceiver, Satan is methodical. When Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, and he says, lest Satan should get an advantage over us, we should not be ignorant of his devices. The word devices there is talking about his methods. We must not be unaware of the purpose and the methods of Satan. His purpose is to deceive, and he's not going to do it haphazardly. Now, we have to think. None of us in this room have lived over 100 years. And we're trying to fight a spiritual battle with a spiritual being who was one of God's most glorious creations, but he's evil. We're trying to use our own understanding and our own logic to fight against Satan. Right? Satan is methodical. He knows what man is made of. He has thousands of years of experience. He has millions and billions of people who he has tempted and drawn away from God. So if we think that we're going to win this struggle with sin without Jesus and his word, then we're fooling ourselves. You can't do it. Because Satan is methodical, just like a person who plays chess. And you think about this next move. If this person is in this situation, then I'll offer them this opportunity, and maybe this can draw them away from following Jesus. He knows how to exploit our circumstances. And the only way to stay safe is to stay close to Christ and stay obedient to him. And then we can understand the operation and the tactics of Satan. But the last point about this is that Satan is smart. And when I say Satan is smart is that he uses the characteristics and the qualities that are already in us. When, when, when Satan used the serpent to tempt Eve, the Bible says in Genesis 3 and verse 1 that the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field. And so the, Satan used that subtlety that was already within the serpent to try to tempt Eve to disobey God. Well, think about it this way. What about when, when uh, Judas betrayed Jesus? While they were sitting there at the Last Supper, the Bible says that then Satan entered into Judas. And he left and went and he sold, uh, sold Jesus and uh, told about his whereabouts for 30 pieces of silver. But the point is, is that uh, Satan doesn't have to put anything in us. He, all, he uses the qualities that are already in us to tempt us to sin. Judas didn't become a thief overnight and a betrayer. He was already that way. But he used that moment and he used that, that moment of weakness to tempt Judas to draw him away. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, neither give place to the devil. 
Don't give Satan a place in your life. You've probably heard it before. Uh, if you if you let him drive, or if you let him ride, he's gonna want to drive. You can't let Satan have the license to locate and legislate in your life. But that's the operation of Satan. So we understand what we're dealing with. That's sin. Right, so, so bringing us back into focus here, we're talking about the Christian life and sometimes how we struggle with sin throughout our lives. First, we understand what sin is. We understand where it comes from. We understand more about Satan and how he operates. But now let's look at the obligation of the saints. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with this? This is going to be a constant for all of us until the day we take our last breath. Satan is going to continue to try to tempt us to sin and there's going to be a struggle back and forth. And so I believe this is what Paul is referring to in Romans chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to Romans chapter 7. And we'll look at it again and we won't go into a lot of detail here uh, tonight, but uh, we will look at some things about what he says in Romans chapter 7 and verses 14 through 21. Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 21. Now, Paul talks about this struggle that he's having. I want to do good, but yet and still, I always find myself not doing the thing that I want to do. My mind says yes, but then I always find myself in a situation where I yield to the things of the flesh. And so, you know, in, in some ways what Paul is saying here is that as human beings, we live in the flesh. And because of that, we're going to have the natural tendency to want to fulfill the things of the flesh. It's a natural thing to want to do these things because this is the, the situation I'm in. This is where I live. I live in the flesh and I live in the world. So my mind may say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. But then Satan is going to try to tempt me and pull me away from Jesus through the lust of my flesh. So how do I deal with this? I think how we deal with it, number one, is that we have to crucify the old man. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Look at chapter 6 and verse number 5 through 7. Paul says, For if we have been planted together in his likeness of his death, we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth, we should not serve sin. We have to crucify the old man. Go down to verse 12. Look at verses 12 and 13. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. And neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now look at verse 20 through 22. For when ye were servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So the first way we deal with this struggle of sin is that we have to crucify the old man. That is, we have to put to death the old person. Those things that you used to do, you have to make a decision that you're not going to do them anymore. Now the Bible says there about a, the crucifying the old man, the crucifixion of the old man really means that the old man is inoperable. Now, we didn't say 
that the old man is not there anymore. See, the old person is still in you, but you choose not to allow this part of yourself to rule and make decisions for you in your life. You have to put to death the old man. Let me give you an example. You know, sometimes when I talk to people and uh, people say things that I think that are rude, and uh, my first reaction is to want to tell them off. I want to get them straight. You know, you don't know who you're talking to. You know, who do you think you are? You know, all these things are going through my mind, right? But I have to remember what God said. I can't let that old man rule and dictate my life. I have to crucify the old man. And the Bible says there, tell, tells me in situations like that, it says, repay evil with good. That, that I should not have any, any uh, bad speech to come out of my mouth. I have to remember that I am a representative of Jesus Christ and a representative of the church of Christ. So I have to put to death the old man, but not only must I put to death the old man, in order to deal with this struggle of sin, I must walk in the light. John says in 1 John 1 and verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You know, I win this battle by crucifying the old man by walking in the light. Now, it's important for us to look at what it means to walk in the light. The word walk there means a, a continuous walk. Then he says, if I walk in the light, that is if I keep on walking in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. That word cleansing means it's a present tense word, and it means a constant cleansing, which means when you put those things together, as long as I continue to walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ continues to cleanse me as long as I stay in the light. So we don't have to worry about our salvation in some sense. As long as I'm walking in the light, I can make a mistake if I'm walking in the light because then the blood cleanses me. You know, sometimes people have the idea that, you know, when you commit one sin, then you're going to go to hell. So that is, I wake up in the morning and I'm saved. And by 10 o'clock, I'm lost. And I repent of my sins, and by noon, I'm saved again. And by 1 o'clock, I'm lost again. And so you got this back and forth all day long. I'm saved, lost, saved, lost. But that's not what God teaches us. When we look at 1 John, it tells us as long as we continue to walk in the light, then the blood is going to cleanse us. And as long as we continue to walk in the light, we can then fight against Satan and understand his tactics and not yield to the flesh. So walking in the light means to be faithful. That is, when I realize I'm wrong, I immediately confess my sins and repent of them. Walking in the light means remaining faithful to the church in attendance, in support, in participation. That's what it means to walk in the light, and these are our obligations if we're going to win this struggle with sin. Crucify the old man. Walk in the light. And the third thing we need to do is we need to trust in God. You need to trust God. Trust God. Proverbs 3 and verses 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That is my dependence on the Lord for everything I need in my life. Trust in him with all my heart. Then I have to defer. I'm talking about that old man earlier. I have to defer and not lean on my own understanding. You know, sometimes I don't understand. I don't understand why Jesus says, love your enemies. I don't understand that. But I know that's what the Lord says do. So I trust him. I don't know why, and I don't understand why Jesus says, pray for them that mistreat you and despitefully use you. 
I don't understand it, but I trust God. And if God said, this is what I need to do in order to be more like him and his son, then I need to trust him. And this is how I win the struggle with sin. In Romans chapter 12, we're coming to a close here. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 17, uh, Paul writes, he says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt reap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So how do I win this struggle? I got to crucify the old man. I got to walk in the light and I got to trust God. I can't lean on my own understanding. And when I do that, the Bible says, in all thy ways, he shall direct thy paths. And the last thing this tonight is an opportunity by the Savior. So as we move from moment to moment in our lives, each moment is an opportunity for us to change and turn to God. Today can be the turning point for you. If you're not a Christian, you can become a Christian by obeying the gospel. And when you obey the gospel, your sins will be washed away. That's what happened to Paul when Paul was on the road to Damascus and a bright light shined on him and he was told to go find Ananias and Ananias told him in Acts 22 and verse 18, he says, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. You see, if you're not a Christian today, this can be the moment things change for you. You can have your sins Washed away. That is, no matter what you've done in your life, it's not so bad that God can't forgive it. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. God will forgive you of your sins if you're willing to be obedient to him. And today can be the day for you. And if you struggle with sin, Jesus says this. Jesus says in Matthew 11 and verse 28, he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're tired of struggling with sin, Jesus says, just come to me. Lay it all at my feet, and I will give you rest for your soul. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're saved. You don't have to worry about Satan and his tactics. You don't have to worry about the things that may come to you in this world because you know that you have laid it all at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says if you come to him, then he will give you the rest for your soul that you're looking for. So my invitation tonight, as we look at these things, the Christian life struggling with sin. You see, the outline of sin tells us what we are dealing with. The origin of sin showed us where it comes from. Operation of Satan, it shows us who we are dealing with. And the obligation of the saints teaches us what we need to do. And finally, there is an opportunity for all of us tonight. And so I hope tonight that you can find some encouragement as you deal with sin, that it is something that you can fight. It is something that you don't have to uh, succumb to. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 that uh, uh, there is no temptation that's taken you but such as is common unto man. 
But God is faithful and will with the temptation will make a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear it. You don't have to give in. You can win this battle. We all can win this battle. But we must crucify the old man, walk in the light, and we must trust God. I hope you trust God today. I hope you give your life to Christ today. If there's anyone today, if there's anyone who needs to respond to the invitation, please do so as we stand and sing.